Excellent. So welcome to the Metasploit team demo meeting for February 25th, 2020. We're just blasting through February here. It's almost time for our bonus leap day this coming Saturday. So, you know, spend it wisely, y'all. Let's hop in. We've got some new modules. Our own WVU added a new module targeting Open SMTPD, OpenBSD's mail server, which exploits a command injection in the mail from field during SMTP interaction with Open SMTPD to execute code as the root user. That's pretty cool. Uh, we'll have a demo of this today. We'll also added a module for authentication bypass of vulnerable WordPress infinite WP plugins. This module will craft and post a payload to bypass authentication and login as the admin user on the target, then drop a payload and execute. We'll also add an auto check logic to the framework library, which is cool. Some good stuff there. And our own Adam Galway created a new module targeting vulnerable versions of cross checks, which is a time and attendance and access control application for Windows systems. This module takes advantage of a buffer overflow in the application by listening for a broadcast from a vulnerable cross-checks instance attempting to detect new access control devices and then responding with malicious code exploiting the buffer overflow and delivering a specified payload for execution on the target. Very nice. Our own Shelby Pace added a module for privilege escalation via vulnerable Rico printer drivers under Windows. For vulnerable drivers, a low privileged user can read write files within the Rico DRV directory and its subdirectories allowing a malicious DLL to be dropped where print isolation host.exe, a Windows process running a system, can attempt to install a malicious DLL as a new printer and gain the user elevated system level privs. It's pretty slick and uh, we'll have a demo of this today. Community contributor B. Coles provided a local exploit module that gains root privileges on targets with the diamorphine rootkit installed. This module leverages the elevate signal, which is typically signal number 64, to elevate privileges to root not too shabby. And community contributor Blurbdurst added a module for gathering and decrypting passwords from vulnerable team view applications on Windows targets. This includes obtaining the options password, which will allow framework users to change the team viewer configuration on the target. It's pretty cool. There's a recording of our, from our previous meeting of this module being demoed if you'd like to see it in action. Community contributor, let's see. This, is, this, this one is from Mata Bereg added a new module for exploiting an arbitrary file write vulnerability in Apache James 2.3.2, which exists due to a lack of input validation when creating a user. By creating a user with a directory traversal payload as the username, commands can be written to specific directory file and give remote code execution. That's pretty cool. And we'll have a demo of this one too. And our own Dean Welch added a module to maintain SSH key persistence on a Windows target with an SSH server installed which brings parity to our existing SSH key persistence uh, ability on Linux targets. Persistence for the win. And we'll have a demo of that as well. Let's talk about some other valuable work going on. Community contributor Hoodie updated the Windows enum patchers post module to gather and store all Windows patches currently applied on a Windows target. For users who are using this module to suggest exploits, the local exploit suggester module should be better suited for that functionality. Our own WVU updated the generate command in MSF console to avoid showing a staged payloads stage by default. This addresses a common usability problem where when generating a large payload, the op output would scroll off the screen. For those users who still want the stage displayed with the stager, you could simply use the new dash V arg that William added. Community contributor B. Coles added a check for CPU vulnerabilities to the enum system post module for Linux targets by gathering information from the sys devices system CPU vulnerabilities directory. Our own Adam Galway updated the set payload command to automatically strip path like prefixes supporting values which begin with slash, payload slash, and slash payload slash. This can be handy if using full, if using full paths for your payloads, for payloads better suits your framework workflow. Our own Spencer McIntyre updated the Z shell completions for MSF console and MSF Venom to correctly reflect current options and capabilities. And our own Jeffrey Martin put a finishing touch on Hoodie's password cracking refactor effort, removing deprecated JTR underscore modules and aliasing their attempted use to automatically load the newer associated crack underscore module for framework users. So some good new stuff there, appreciate that. And a few bug fixes. 
Our own Spencer McIntyre fixed the usage of get sock name and get local name methods for the SOX 5 server when used with rec sockets backed by our interpreter channel. Community contributor Green M fixed the reverse Perl SSL and reverse PHP SSL payloads to skip verifying the SSL certificate, which is required for the most recent versions of Perl and PHP, I'm told. Community contributor Fra fixed the anti-malware scan interface bypass for Windows targets in the web direct, sorry, web delivery module, separating out the bypass action from the payload delivery. Fra also added a fix for the password prompt spoof module so that it correctly displays the spoofed prompt on newer versions of OSX like Catalina and Mojave. Community contributor Hoodie added default users to the Microsoft SQL login and MySQL login modules. Our own Adam Kamek vendored the recently added expect library, which is used by the new open SMTPD module we just mentioned to ensure Windows installs the framework operate correctly. And our own Brent Cook made a pass through module URL references and updated ones which were pointing to outdated Rapid7 blog URLs to ensure they point to current Rapid7 blog URLs. Some good fixes there, appreciate all those. And a bonus slide. Uh, we have more exciting news related to our new attacker knowledge-based web app offering. Attacker KB is a new resource to highlight hacker community knowledge on which phones matter most and why. Uh, we launched beta last week, invited a gaggle of new users who had expressed interest using, using attacker KB. So yeah, if you're interested in participating in the beta, Caitlin put up an informative blog post linked there in the slide uh, with more details about attacker KB and info on how to sign up like throw your hat in the ring for beta participation. And for details on recent framework activity, you can always check out the weekly Metasploit wrap-up blog post at blog.rapid7.com. And we do appreciate all of y'all who help make Metasploit better through your contributions to the project. Thank you for that. Apache James Arbitrary File Right. Mr. De La Fuente, are you on the line? Hey, yeah. Um, ah, I'm sure. Cool, I'll stop my share there. Okay, um, so Apache James, uh, so this model exploits um, an arbitrary file write vulnerability uh, in Apache James 2.3.2. Uh, so this is a main server. Actually, James stands for Java Apache Mail Enterprise Server. And uh, yeah, so this issue is due to a uh, lack of input validation when creating a user. So I'm going to start video here. Uh, <clears throat> so this main server has, um, so we have to set a couple of options here. The one of the important thing we need to have is access to the administrative Port, which is on 4555 with the password and the username um, because we need to create users to exploit this vulnerability. So other options are the uh, remote host, the pub 3 port, and the, the remote port, which is 25, the um, default SMTP port. So we're setting the payload. Um, and something important here is the targets. So we're going to use the default one, which is Chrome. Um, how all of this works. So when you create a user with the past Tron you're going to write some, uh, all the emails you sent to the user to uh, an arbitrary location on, on the mail server. So in this case, it's going to be the Chrome.d uh, directory. So what's gonna happen is we're gonna write the payload with some cron uh, directive and every minute it's gonna be executed on the server. So let's see what's going on. So we're gonna SSH uh, to the node server. And uh, we're gonna have a look to the cron.d directory. So here we can see this, we have, we have two files, which are actually the mails we just sent to the user. So here it is. And here is our payload, which is actually, uh, it's, it's, it's a Chrome task, right? So ju we'll just wait for Chrome to execute the payload. It can take like one minute, one minute or two minutes, depending on 
how um, how fast the the mail has been written. Yeah, so here it is. So we wrote which, uh, because it's uh, the Chrome process that is running this. That's cool. So one thing that needs to be uh, uh, one things we need to know about this is the all the junk that the email uh, um, insert in this file at the beginning before the Chrome task uh, is actually an issue with the newer Chrome versions. For the older versions, it's just ignore it and uh, that's fine. But for the newer, it's break everything and Chrome, the Chrome task is not executed. So we have another option here, uh, we target zero. It's the bash completion, which is pretty much the same idea. So we're gonna write a file, we're gonna write the emails to the bash completion directory here. So let's run it. So now because the exploitation is passive, we're gonna wait for a user to log in to the server and it will trigger the execution of the batch completion payload. So we have to start the handler manually and wait for a user to log in. There we go. So we're gonna check the batch completion. It, it takes a bit of time for the email. Yeah, so here we go. S uh, this file contains the payload. There we go. Yep. And so now we're going to simulate uh, a user connection, a user login. So I'm going to log off and SSH the game. There we go. So now we have our session. So now, because the user that just logged in, uh, is not root, it's a normal user, we're not root, uh, we, we don't have a, a, a root session. But yeah, that's pretty nice. And that's it. Nice. Taco Smoose, also known as Brendan. You there, sir? I'll stop my share if you are. I am. Uh, actually, uh, you have a video? Oh, I might. Let's see. I have a video. Should I play the video? Please do. All right, roll tape. Or video, sorry. This is a this is an edition from Semper Victus that has been kind of a long time coming. Uh, it's really cool because we now have a new type of payload uh, in supporting SSH as as a transport. Uh, in this particular case, we're j I'm just going to set up a uh, multi handler uh, for this uh, new payload type, and I'm going to use the uh, reverse S the command Unix reverse SSH, which just takes advantage of the, uh, the built-in SSH on Unix systems. If you can, you can see that I'm setting up the handler. Uh, on the right, you can see that I've created the payload locally, uh, just calling back on uh, loopback. Start the listener. Start the payload. And we get a call back now through an SSH session. Nice. The advantage here is there's several more payloads we can develop. We can develop that will use this uh, particular transport, and that's really kind of nice. Super cool. Any questions for Brendan on, on this item? Very nice. Thanks, Brendan. Yeah. Dig it. And we've got a Rico driver Privesk demo. Brendan, you're gonna. I think I've got the video queued up for this one too. If you're if you're good for it. Sure. Happy to. I appreciate that. This is a neat little uh, bug in Rico drivers. Uh, it's one of a, a, a class of uh, vulnerabilities that I've been seeing a lot from, which is basically a file system race condition for permissions. Uh, when you create a uh, Rico printer, it populates the drive, uh, it populates a directory with a bunch of files, including a DLL. These are all created based on the permissions of the parent directory, which is read and writable to everyone. During the process, it changes those permissions. 
Um, and in here, we, we've got a session set up. Uh, we're about to send it up. The key is to overwrite one of the DLL files between the time that it is created and the time that it is protected. And doing so will then launch the DLL by a trusted process. In this case, I believe it's the printer isolation host, which seems somewhat ironic. Uh, but what winds up happening is if you overwrite that DLL in the right time, that DLL gets loaded and you get a session. So it's, it's kind of neat. I've seen a couple of these styles. Questions? Super cool. Thank you, Brendan. No worries. And because this is a uh, Rico, they're uh, very common in businesses. So you probably would see this on, uh, on some red team engagements. There you go. Pro tip there. Cool. Windows SSH persistence. Mr. Welch, you with us? Yep. About me. Cool. You want uh, just to run the video? Ah, uh, yes, please. All right. So, so this is actually going to go over um, two modules real quick. If you can even see my screen, it's a little small. Um, the first one is uh, is a post module for installing the OpenSSH server on a Windows target machine. Uh, you can see that's running there now. I've already um, set this up with a, as a session beforehand. So you can see that's now installed OpenSSH. So I'm going to switch over to the SSH key persistence module for Windows. Um, so using the same session I used to install OpenSSH, I can run this, which will generate and upload the, uh, the necessary SSH keys. And then let's just be able to test this here and set the right permissions on the key that was created. And hopefully we should be able to get a, a session on the, on the Windows target. Um, and yeah, and that's the, that's the whole thing. If we can, if we can see this shot working. I type so slow. <laughs> <laughs> yep, there we go. Cool. Nice, thanks Dean. Yeah. Any questions for Dean? Dean, I, I got a question. Dean, do you guys, do you guys, so you install the server and run it at the same time? Is that how it works? Uh, well, yes. You have it installed. You don't have it to have running. So that, that, that running of the, the first module is what's installing the OpenSSH server on the target box. And, and then it runs the server itself or, or, or you don't have to have it running? Uh, no, it, it starts up uh, automatically. I think okay. there's, a, there's a flag in there, uh, auto start, which, uh, right. which I have set to true there, which does that. Awesome. Thanks. That's, that's neat. Mr. Boo, you with us? Hey there. Uh, hey. Let me, let me share. So um, recently in the news, there's been um, OpenSMTDBD, which is a default mail daemon for Open, uh, OpenBSD. And uh, someone discovered, uh, Qualys to be specific, discovered a command injection in the software. And uh, we've written a module for that, so I'll go ahead and demonstrate that. So we can use it here. We can see the info. Um, I work with Ray Gell team in on this. So it takes a few different arguments. Uh, root uh, is a default for receipt two. You need to specify a valid mail recipient. Uh, root's usually a good one. Uh, Postmaster is another. Um, and then otherwise that, uh, uh, our host, our port, and um, <clears throat> you can show payloads here. Whoa, yeah, a lot of them. Uh, um, right now the default I think is uh, reverse netcat, which is generally pretty reliable and portable between different OSs. And uh, I guess we can actually start by doing connect. Seven, I think, actually, See if it has a V op. Uh oh. See if it has a V option. Um, no, it doesn't. So we can connect here. Oh, sorry. 
there it is. So you can see the server. Um, you can uh, send uh, some commands, etc. So it is up and running. Uh, here it is. So Okay, so we've configured all we really need to do is our host and L host. Um, the rest you can configure as you wish. And um, actually, it might be a good idea to one, two, three, four, five. Uh, see what it looks like in traffic. Actually, let me K trace. All right, going as fast as I can here. You're good. Uh, that should be good. Oh. Well, for that. Okay, so we can run check here. <clears throat> should work. Oh, it's a little slow, probably because of K trace and all the VM here. But we can run, and it uses expect to send and receive certain patterns, as you can see. Here's the actual exploit. Um, we've modified it for randomization, removed some extra characters. So we can do these uh, safety lines, if you will. Um, and then you can send your arbitrary command, which is netcat shell. And you have it a root shell over there. Um, there it is. See if I can find exec here. Uh, maybe not. Anyway, uh, yeah, he uses net network traffic right here. You can see it's rather a simple exploit. Cool. And there weren't there a whole bunch of other critical open SMTPD bugs, I think, announced yesterday? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Can't find it here. Sorry, it's been a while since I've used Ktrace. Anyway, that's all there is to it. Should be nice. used. Thanks, Will. Thank you. Excellent.